Konnichiwa and welcome dear viewers to this rather quick video. The subject of today's video is a political theory that I discovered while exploring the depths of Wikipedia. And it's that downright peculiar that if someone would propose it today, they would be called terminally online. Before we get any further into this, some very big disclaimers. Firstly, this video will not have a lot of substance. Its existence is solely justified by me finding this theory funny and that no one else has made a YouTube video on it so far. I must admit that my sources are kinda lacking, considering that you can't find much more about this subject than a Wikipedia article whose sources linked below are mostly in Japanese or inaccessible for other reasons. And secondly, I wouldn't be surprised if in a couple of years or so, someone came out to admit they made the whole thing up to prove a point about Wikipedia being easy to manipulate or something like that. We do a little trolling, it's called we do a little trolling. So, while I hope you enjoy this video, keep in mind it's meant for entertainment purposes only. But now, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I present the Ainu Revolution Theory. Before actually going into what it is on a substantive level, let's pick apart the term on a literal word-by-word -word basis, from back to front. A theory, in science for example, refers to a possible explanation for a set of observations that has been repeatedly tested and supported by evidence. In politics, however, it very well may refer to a set of ideas or principles that seek to explain how political systems should function and what goals they should pursue. The word revolution finds its origins in the Latin verb revolvere, which means to unroll or to roll back. The term revolution itself, however, refers to a radical change or transformation. In the political context, it almost always implies the overthrow of those in power, oftentimes violently. The Ainu are an ethnicity indigenous to the lands by the Sea of Otchotsk in general, but nowadays mostly just present on Hokkaido. Hokkaido being the northernmost, second largest, yet second least populous of the four Japanese main islands. Their traditional language, the Hokkaido Ainu, the last surviving member of the Ainuic language family, can't be linked to any other language groups with certainty. It suffered under past assimilation policies and is now considered to be critically endangered by UNESCO. However, the exact numbers of native speakers or speakers in general is unknown. As the aforementioned assimilation policies imply, the Ainu share the fate of many people subject to colonization, in the sense that after ethnic Japanese settled Hokkaido, they imposed their will and culture upon those already living there. And this oppression was probably what made the Ainu the subject of this theory, more so than their quote-unquote primitive communistic social structures as suggested by some of its proponents. Before we finally even get into the actual substance of the theory, let me set the stage. And for that, we got to travel back in time into the 1960s. Back then, the Japanese New Left saw the light of day. This New Left brought about one fringe group that was most likely influential in the creation of this theory. Anti-Japaneseism. This ideology is not to be confused with a general anti-Japanese sentiment as it may still be held by some Koreans and Chinese due to Japan's past imperialism. It's much more akin to anti-Germanism in a sense of being ethnic self-hatred. Japanese people following this ideology believe the Japanese nation itself to be basically intrinsically evil and thus worthy of destruction because they saw the history of Japan as not much more than a history of invasion and exploitation. They consequentially felt sympathetic to those affected by it. Not just people outside of Japan, namely the Koreans, but also ethnic minorities inside of Japan like Ryukians and Ainu people. Furthermore, in the 1970s, the position that the lumpen proletariat may be the key to achieving a communist revolution gained favor amongst elements of Japan's new left, 
One group that was deemed to be worthy of leading this revolution were the Ainu, which is rather ridiculous if you excuse me bringing my own opinion into this, considering simply the demographic issue. I'll be using modern data for that, but it's just to visualize my point. So let's take a look at some of the numbers. Japan has a population of around 125 million and Hokkaido, the Ainu's homeland, has a population of around 5 million, so 4% of the entire Japanese population. According to the prefecture of Hokkaido's Hokkaido Ainu Life Survey, little more than 13,000 Ainu live in Hokkaido, which is about 0.26% of the prefecture's population and a decrease by 21.85 percentage points of the number when compared to the 2013 survey. Unless I just had an epic math fail. Let the following sink in. Even if the percentage of Ainu in Hokkaido was four times higher than it is right now, they would still just barely constitute a bit more than 1% of the island's population. The following map shows the spread of registered Ainu in Hokkaido subprefectures as of 1999. Don't get confused as I did at first, but the stated percentage does not denote the percentage of the subprefectures population who are Ainu. In actuality, it points out what percentage of Ainu in Hokkaido live in what subprefecture. That's why it all adds up to 100%. But over all the amusement about the theory's absurdity we are having, we should not overlook that it actually inspired cases of domestic terrorism. That by the way were almost exclusively committed by Wajin, which is the term Ainu call non-Ainu, since similar to the ideology of anti-Japaneseism, the Ainu revolution theory was mostly supported by ethnic Japanese. One of these cases happened on the 23rd of October 1972, when the East Asia Anti-Japan Armed Front set off simultaneous explosions at the Fusetsu no Gunzo monument in the city of Asahikawa and the Institute of Northern Cultures of Hokkaido University in the prefecture's capital Sapporo. In Sapporo, the target were Ainu artifacts displayed at the university, in Asahikawa, it was a statue depicting a group of Japanese pioneers surrounding a sitting Ainu. This sculptural group had, since its unveiling in 1970, already been the subject of protests by Ainu activists due to them seeing it as demeaning to their people. And when it was rebuilt in 1977, they protested again. Other bombings occurred in 1975, damaging the Sapporo police headquarters and in March of 76, killing two people at the Docho building, which to my understanding is the seat of the prefectural government. And once again, the East Asia Anti-Japanese Front claimed responsibility, stating Japan's policies towards minorities, particularly the Ainu, and to protest against the alleged colonial rule of Hokkaido's police over the Ainu as their reason for the attacks. But even an outright assassination attempt is part of the story. In March of 1974, the 22-year-old Japanese man Yagi Tatsumi from Hiroshima entered the office of Asari Gichi, the also Wajin mayor of the city of Shiraoi, in Hokkaido's south-central Iburi subprefecture, to stab him into the neck with murderous intent. His motive was the city's Ainu village, which he saw as exploitative, arguing that the Ainu working there were receiving relatively low wages to create artifacts for the profit of non-Ainu. Seemingly, he wasn't the only one thinking so, for at a later date, another individual set fire to the local tourist office for the same reason. Thanks a lot for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it, I hope it was entertaining. Whatever your opinion may be, leave a comment in the comment section below, leave a like if you liked the video, share the video, check out all the links in the video description, and if you haven't done so already, and I don't know why, subscribe to the channel, activate the notification bell, so you won't miss a single other video in the future. I don't know what to say anymore, so I hope you have a nice day, see you next time, and stay crispy. 
So comrades, as we all know, the revolution must and eventually will come, but the specifics are still unclear. That's what we call this meeting. First point of order, who should lead that revolution? Thank you, Brian. You may start. Well, I think it's always good to get inspiring, especially from successful examples in the past. So when taking a look at two successful revolutions, the Russian and the of the Chen's one, we can see that the revolutionary base consisted mostly of peasants. The second, this may be the way to go. Go off the rice fields, comrades. I certainly see where you're coming from, Ryan, but this approach seems rather anachronistic to me, you see. We're all largely agrarian societies, so having the peasantry as the revolutionary base made it totally sense. We hope you live in an industrialized country, so I think the only realistic primary foundation of our revolution can be the industrial proletariat. Listen up, lads, I just noticed that we as ethnic Japanese can totally suck. You know, so it lead our revolution an ethnic minority that makes up a vanishingly low percentage of the population and doesn't even make up the majority in its ancestral homeland. He <laughs> he.